go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this Sabbath day. We're grateful for this oasis in time, uh, for refreshment, for rest, for encouragement, for fellowship, uh, for ministry. We just pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us in all that we do today. We pray for the Holy Spirit to strengthen us as we share together. And uh, we're grateful for your presence on this very special day as we uh, participate in the foot washing and in the emblems of your broken body in our behalf. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start this morning by asking a question or two. Um, how many people were in the upper room? 20 some? Maybe 70? Okay, but so we're not talking about thousands, are we? Okay. What time of year was it when Jesus and the disciples gathered in the upper room? What time of year was it? What was going on in Jerusalem at that time? Song, what was it? Passover. That's right, Passover. And during the three feasts, uh, the three feasts of the Jews that were required for all the men to attend, and of course, they'd bring their children. How many people were in Jerusalem? They were coming from all over the Mediterranean world, weren't they, to worship for this Passover? How many people do you think were there? Ballpark it for me. Maybe uh, 100,000? Uh, 500,000? A million? Okay, now, folk are coming from all over the world. I've read accounts that that final Passover of Christ, there were between two and three million people in Jerusalem for that Passover. So two to three million Jews coming from all over the Mediterranean world to worship God in Jerusalem. Now, let's, let's make sure we've got it real clear in our minds. Now, what day of the week did those people, what day did they worship on? Saturday. So that made them, what would you call somebody who worshiped on Saturday? A, a, what do you call them? A seventh day something. Now, so these people were worshiping on the seventh day of the week, weren't they? And whose coming were they looking forward to? They were looking forward to the Messiah's coming, weren't they, Brother Jess? Now, what do you call somebody who is looking for the coming of Christ? What do you call that? An Adventist, don't you? So the people that were worshiping in Jerusalem that Passover season, they were Seventh-day Adventists, weren't they? That's who they were. So there were about two to three million Seventh-day Adventists in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. Now, were all two to three million of those Seventh-day Adventists, were they all in the upper room? No, they weren't, were they, Maria? There was a handful there was a handful of Seventh-day Adventists in the upper room. And clearly, clearly there was a distinction between the Seventh-day Adventists in the upper room and the mob of Seventh-day Adventists 
that were worshiping in the temple. Was, there was a distinction, wasn't there? A clear difference. Because the, the little cluster, the, the little group of men and some women in that upper room that night, they were a real small minority, weren't they? A real small minority of people. While the great bulk of what would we call it? Conference? Uh, denominational? Nominal Adventism? They weren't there, were they? They weren't in the upper room, were they? No, they weren't. They weren't. Because there were two clear, distinct groups of Seventh-day Adventists in the first century, folk. There was very much like what we see today. Very much like what we see today. Now, about seven weeks later, after that final Passover, after the crucifixion of Christ, there was another feast that the Adventists in the first century were honoring. What was it called? It was about seven weeks after Passover. What was it called? Pentecost song, that's right. And that's exactly what Pentecost meant. It meant the Feast of 50. 50 days after the Passover was Pentecost. Now, at Pentecost, There were some people that got together in an upper room in Jerusalem, aren't there? Now, who was in that upper room in Jerusalem? You remember? Who was it? I heard somebody say it. Ms. Crespo, what was it? I think I heard you say it. You want to say it again? There were 120, weren't there? There were 120 Seventh-day Adventists in the upper room. But wait a minute, there was a, a feast. The Feast of Pentecost was taking place. There were probably two to three million Adventists in Jerusalem. But they weren't all in the upper room, were they? there was clearly a distinction. The 120 in the upper room, they wanted to follow the Lord. They wanted to proclaim his truth throughout the world. The great bulk of Adventism, they were just playing a game called church. That's what they were doing. They were playing a game called church. And they, all they wanted, as we've read in Desire of Ages, they wanted worldly honor and they wanted riches. Clear distinction between the two. Clear distinction. Which of those two classes, friends, now think about that before you answer. Was it the small group of faithful Adventists in the upper room or was it the great bulk of the denominational Adventism? On which of those groups did the Holy Spirit fall? Do you remember? On the 120. That's right. The Holy Spirit did not fall on nominal Adventism, did it? Didn't fall on nominal Adventism. In fact, the organization of Seventh-day Adventists in the first century, what did they call the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? What did they say about those faithful Adventists in the upper room. What did they say about them? They were, drunk. they were drunk. 
So nominal Adventism had gone so far away from God that when the early rain fell on those faithful men and women in the upper room, the denomination said, they're drunk with new wine. Wow. So folk, the falling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was not based on being in a church, was it? That's not what it was based on. It was based on, who am I following? Who is the king of my life? And those who had submitted themselves to Jesus, the early rain fell on them. Wasn't dependent on being a part of the organized body, was it? That's not where God's approval rested. It rested on those who were in submission to Jesus Christ. That's where the early rain fell. That's where it fell. How about for Jesus himself? How about for Jesus himself? You know, in this really neat little book, if you don't have it and you've never read it, you need to get it. Mine's been through a war, it looks like. Uh, I can't even see the front cover much anymore. It's called Decision at the Jordan by Lewis Walton. It's a dynamite book. You've got to get it. In fact, my, I think I might need to get one too. Uh, but on this page, page 42... He says this, I love this. He says it was springtime in Jerusalem, a festive time filled with preparations for Passover, bright with springtime's flowers. But for Jesus, it was already late autumn. Now, how can that be? It was springtime in Jerusalem. And the author says, but for Jesus, it was late in the autumn. Never had his life seemed so destined for defeat. Sure, he had brilliantly outclassed the Pharisees, defeating them at the very word games with which they had tried to trap him. But he could not win their hearts. The highest leadership of his chosen people, the cream of the cream, if one chose to think of it in human terms, not only had rejected him, but would soon murder him. It was springtime in Jerusalem, but there was death on the wind. And at whose hands, at whose hands would Jesus ultimately be killed? At whose hands? You say, well, Pilate was the one who said, take him out and crucify him. Yeah, but who, who was it? Who was it, friend, that took Jesus and threw him at the feet of Pontius Pilate? Who did that? Professing Seventh-day Adventist song. That's right. Professing Seventh-day Adventists. As we've noticed in our brief series so far in the desire, you know, in the life of Christ, from the time of Jesus' birth all the way till the time he died, Jesus was hunted he was hunted like a wild animal by the denominational church. And finally, in 31 AD, when it was springtime in Jerusalem, 
There was death on the wind. There was death on the wind. I want to read just a few statements, a few little thoughts from Desire of Ages that I find just precious as we prepare this morning for the foot washing and the Lord's Supper. This is Desire of Ages, page 655. It says, Though Jesus knew Judas from the beginning, he washed his feet. The betrayer was privileged to unite with Christ in partaking of the sacrament. A long-suffering Savior held out every inducement for the sinner to receive him, to repent, and to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus held out every possible inducement for Judas to receive him, to repent, to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. And then Ellen White says, this example is for us. When we suppose one to be in error and sin, we're not to divorce ourselves from him. By no careless separation are we to leave him a prey to temptation or drive him upon Satan's battleground. This is not Christ's method. It was because the disciples were erring and faulty that he washed their feet. And all but one of the twelve were thus brought to repentance. So this morning, as we wash one another's feet, Christ is here, the Holy Spirit is here, to impress upon our each of our hearts and minds the fact that Jesus wants to wash away sin from each of our lives today. Praise God. How, how precious. <laughs> how precious is the Lord. Finally, one other statement I want to read. It's Desire of Ages, page 659. It says, the communion service was not to be a season of sorrowing. This was not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather about his table, they are not to remember and lament their shortcomings. They're not to dwell upon their past religious experience, whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They're not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. The preparatory service has embraced all this. The self-examination, the confession of sin, the reconciling of differences has all been done. Now they come to meet with Christ. They are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. They are to open the soul to the bright beams of the sun of righteousness. With hearts cleansed by Christ's most precious blood, in full consciousness of his presence, although unseen, they are to hear his words, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. John 14, 27. Our Lord says, under conviction of sin, remember, I died for you. When oppressed and persecuted and afflicted for my sake and the Gospels, remember my love so great that for you I gave my life. When your duties appear stern and severe and your burdens too heavy to bear, remember that for your sake I endured the cross, despising the shame. When your heart shrinks from the trying ordeal, remember that your Redeemer liveth 
to make intercession for you. How precious is that? <laughs> How precious is that? I'm thankful this morning as we participate in this service that the Lord has promised he, he is here. And that as we wash one another's feet, that Christ is here to let us know that he will wash away he will wash away sin from our lives and uh, that we can have peace and we can have joy as we move forward. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just pray for each one of us today that we will be among that group, not aspiring for high places, not aspiring to be within the great conference cathedral, but I want to be, Lord, in that group that are humbling themselves, claiming your promises, and seeking to share your truth with others. Bless us, Lord, to be in that upper room with those faithful men and women who experienced your forgiveness, who experienced your strength and power in their lives. Help us all to be among that group upon whom you will pour the latter rain. Bless us as we participate in this service now to know that you are here and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.